Justin, you have been initiated into the Slide Advancers Club. Congratulations. <laughs> How reliable are you? When you tell someone that you're going to do something, do they know absolutely for sure, without a doubt in their mind, that you're going to do it? Or has past experience sort of taught them that, well, you talk a good game, but you don't exactly follow through with it? I want you to think about that for a moment. But I also want you to shift gears a little bit and think about this. In, in your mind, how reliable is God? For example, when he says, like he does in Philippians 4 verse 9, that he will supply for your every need, do you really believe it? Or, you know, after he has done so much for you time and time again, do you need one more sign? To show that he's really in control. Kind of like Gideon. You remember, you know, the wet fleece, dry ground, dry ground, wet fleece, whole thing and everything. And then he still, even after those pretty impressive things, needed some more reassurance that God was going to take care of him and God was going to give him the victory. If you struggle with this sort of thing, with seeing God as truly reliable, I've got some good news for you. You're not alone. You're not only, in fact, in fact, you're in some pretty good company, as a matter of fact. You see, uh, uh, the disciples apparently struggled with this as well. If you would open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Back in chapter 6, Verses 30 through 44, we read about Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus. And, and shortly after that, uh, uh, we, we see him walking on the water and things of that nature. And, and I've, I've told you in the past that one of the themes of the Gospel of Mark seems to be the disciples' struggles to come to grips with the identity of Jesus and more importantly, what that identity really means. Well, Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 21, is yet another example that they do not understand about Jesus. These stories that happen in uh, Mark 8, 1 through 21, there are three of them, and they all point to the disciples' failure to get it. They don't get it. They don't understand. They don't comprehend. They haven't figured it out, really. In, in two of them, the disciples are the, the primary focus. In one of them, well, let's just say the Pharisees are at it again. But then that story is tied in with the one that comes after it that shows the disciples not getting it. Let's begin by looking at the feeding of the 4,000 in chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. It says, in those days... When again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have had nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from, a, from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can we feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he, said to them, he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that those also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanthua. 
Let's begin by looking at the setting of this story. We're told in the, at the very first of, of, chapter, of chapter 8, verse 1, in those days. In those days is one of those connecting phrases. It, uh, it connects this miracle with the things that had been going on in the preceding chapter. Now, some would say that it very weakly connects the two, but they probably wouldn't deny that there is something of a connection, even, no matter how weak it is or how, how uh, flimsy or, or whatever the evidence is. There's probably a connection between chapter 8 and the last part of chapter 7. And if so, then we would be in the region of the Decapolis. Now remember the region of the Decapolis, it was a largely, uh, predominantly uh, Gentile area, though there were some Jews who lived in the area. Uh, it wasn't exclusively Gentile, but th there were some Jews there um, with a great crowd that had come from far away, apparently, or some of them had come from far away, apparently, uh, had gathered. Um, wouldn't be the first time. Chapter 7.33 tells us there was a crowd of people with Jesus and he took the deaf mute away from the crowd to heal him. And so a crowd, about a great crowd, chapter 8, verse 1, verse 3 tells us, had gathered and they had been without food for three days. Now there are some additional facts that we need to know about this story. Number one, they were in a desolate place. So when Jesus asks his disciples you know, to, to, to take care of these people's physical need and their hunger, I mean, even if they had the who knows how much money that would be required in order to buy bread for all of these people, they were not in a place that would have had any stores, okay? They wouldn't have been able to buy it unless they had gone a great, di great distance away it's because they were in a desolate place. In fact, Matthew 15, verse 38, tells us that the number of people there were 4,000 men plus women and children. Just like when he fed the 5,000, it was 5,000 plus the women and children. Matthew tells us it was 4,000 plus the women and children. So that sets up the, the, the story. Well, now let's take a look at the miracle. Notice that the miracle was prompted by Jesus' compassion. Verses 2 and 3 tell us. Jesus doesn't want to send them away hungry. Now this actually is, I believe, the third time in Mark's Gospel that we're told Jesus' compassion for people caused him to act in a certain way. Well, so he, he, his compassion, he doesn't want to send them away hungry. But there's a little bit of uh, mystery here. Uh, some say that uh, uh, it's unclear, uncertain, if he means they had not eaten in three days that they had been with him, or that when they started meeting three days ago, there was food, but the food had run out. You know, and really, you know, there are people who want to make a big deal about whether it means one or the other. It really doesn't matter. The point is that they hadn't eaten in a while. In fact, that they hadn't eaten in a long enough while that Jesus is concerned for their well-being. Uh, they may have run out of whatever food they did have. They may not have had any food at all for three days. Jesus' compassion says, I need to take care of these people. So as prompted by Jesus' compassion, it was preceded by the disciples' question. Notice Jesus tells them to eat, feed the, the, the crowds and the disciples say, where can we, and you might emphasize that word we, where can we get enough food to feed these people? <coughs> where can we do it? I mean, it's so odd the similarities between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. It's so odd that at least one of the disciples didn't say, duh, this has happened before. But they don't. They, 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 they don't remember. I don't know. They just, they just don't remember the same thing happening before. So Jesus asks them, how many loaves do you have? 
This is key. And I want you to remember that question because we're going to come back to it at the end of the lesson. He asks how many loaves they have. They give him seven loaves and a few small fish. And all of a sudden, 4,000 plus are fed with seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. Now then, once they are fed, the post-feeding activity is very special as well. It says that they pick up seven baskets full of leftovers. Some versions may have seven large baskets. And if we just go with what the English versions say here, we're almost tempted to think, well, he started with more and ended up with less left over than with the 5,000 and fed less people and everything. So, so his power must have been fading or dwindling or something. But actually, if you look back at the two words in the original language, the baskets in chapter uh, 6 with the 4,000, or the 5,000, and in chapter 8 with the 4,000, they're not the same word. With the 5,000, it was sort of a hand basket sort of thing. It was a, a, a consistently sized basket that was used for measuring things. And there were 12 of those left over. But when you come to chapter 8, the word for baskets is, it might, it might actually, which is why some say large baskets, it might actually be more accurately translated as a hamper. In fact, a hamper that was large enough for a full-grown man to hide in. I say, now, wait a second. Where do you get that? Well, you get that from Acts chapter 9. What does Acts have to do with it? Well, remember in Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus is in Damascus. He's become a Christian, and the people in Damascus don't like it very much, and they're going to try and kill him when he leaves. And so his, uh, his friends take him and put him in a basket and lower him outside the city wall. That basket had to be big enough to hold Saul, didn't it? That's the exact same Greek word that's used in Mark chapter 8 for baskets. So it's not like they have just a little bit of leftovers. They've got a ton of leftovers, okay? Uh, and they didn't, they, again, they have more left over than they started with. That's pretty impressive. How many of you at your uh, family gatherings and so forth this past week, how many of you had more leftovers than what you started with? No, you didn't. Have, that, that's not a problem, is it? Well, here, they, they have more left over than what they started with. Then they get into a boat and they leave the region. Probably uh, they're in the region of the Decapolis, which is southeast of the Sea of Galilee. They probably travel to the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And I said, well, why don't we know for sure? I mean, it tells us right there that they went to uh, Dal Dalmutha, uh, Dal Dalmanutha, uh, the district of Dalmanutha. See, the problem is, that this region is unknown outside of the Gospel of Mark. If you look at Matthew's account, Matthew says they went to Magadan. And there's various spellings of that. And its exact location is not exactly known today. But we can reasonably assumed that it was on the west side, west bank of the Sea of Galilee because later on of contextual clues. Um, it fits with them going to the other side, Mark 8, verse 13, and arriving in Bethsaida, Mark 8, verse 22, which was to the northeast of the Sea of Galilee. So it makes sense that they now leave the southeast and go to the, we the western side so that they can go across the sea to the other side, which would be, again, on the eastern uh, part of it. It really doesn't matter much, does it? What matters is that they, he's fed the 5,000 the 5, and he immediately dismissed the crowd and, and went away. He's fed the 4,000, he does the same thing. He dismisses the crowd and they leave, the, leave that area. But when they get to wherever it is that they were going there on the west, west, in all likelihood, side of the Sea of Galilee, he has another run-in with the Pharisees. 
And the Pharisees are at it again. They demand a sign. Let's see what Mark 8, 11 through 13 tells us. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat, and went to the other side. You know, the Pharisees' question on this occasion is something of a good one. Okay? I mean, you've got to give credit where credit is due. They ask a, a, a tough question. In fact, this, their question raises a problem of interpretation. Because, you see, there are other uses of the word sign in the Gospels and in the New Testament. In fact, John, in his Gospel, routinely refers to Jesus' miracles, not necessarily as miracles, but as signs. You read through the book of Acts, and when the disciples, the apostles, are able to do miraculous things, it's often referred to as signs. In fact, even later on in Mark's Gospel, in Mark chapter 16, verse 17, he refers to some miraculous things that the followers of Jesus would be able to do, and he calls them signs. So the problem with the interpretation here of this word, well, there are really two questions, okay? First of all, how could the Pharisees ask for a sign? I mean, if... The miracles that Jesus was able to do are called signs elsewhere. And the Pharisees had seen Jesus do some of these miracles. They, they had witnessed them themselves. They had heard about it. They had talked to the people uh, whom Jesus had miraculously healed, for example. If they knew he had been doing uh, the ability to do miracles, then wouldn't that be enough of a sign if miracles are called signs elsewhere? Second question that we have to ask is how could Jesus say no sign will be given? I mean, if the miracles that he had done, and he had done lots of them. I mean, as I've, as I've told you before, Mark's gospel is filled with miracles that Jesus performs. If no sign will be given to this generation, how can Jesus say no sign will be given if he's doing miracles? Well, there's a fairly simple explanation for this. Apparently, sign has a special sense when it is used in this context in Mark chapter 8. See, notice they were asking for a sign from heaven. Okay, we, we, they could rationalize and say, well, all of these miraculous things Jesus has been doing, those were signs from earth. Although, we see how silly that logic sounds. I mean, you don't open the eyes of a blind man with any power that's available here on, on this planet. It's got to be from heaven. So anyway, uh, maybe they want a, a sign from heaven. Perhaps like Joshua in Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, where he commands the sun and the moon to stand still and, and a day is added. It's because they obey Him and they don't go, the sun doesn't set and the moon doesn't move or anything like that for a full day. Uh, perhaps what they are interested in, what they want to see is they want God to tear open the sky and speak from heaven and saying, this is my Son. Listen to Him. Kind of like what some people experienced at Jesus' baptism. Mark 1, verse 11 and other passages in the Gospels. Or like Peter, James, and John experienced at the Transfiguration, we'll read about in Mark chapter 9, verse 7. See, such a sign would certainly be more convincing than just the miracles by themselves. I mean, this would be God Himself intervening and saying, yes, Jesus is my Son, and you should listen to what He has to say. They, they would require a lot less interpretation for sure. I mean, this is God talking. You know, you, you would have to listen. But Jesus says no such sign would be given. Not to Jesus' uh, generation in general and not to the Pharisees in particular. 
Something else you, that we need to notice here is that after they asked for a sign, after they demanded a sign, Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit. This, I believe, shows his frustration with the leaders. His deep frustration with the leaders. After everything that he had done and up to that point, and that they had seen, that they had witnessed, that they had talked amongst themselves about, trying to convi try to tr figure out just how they could use it against him. After everything he had done to that point, they still want more quote-unquote signs of his identity. I want you to hold on to that thought too. And we'll come back to it in a few minutes. But for right now, let's turn our attention to Mark 8, 14 through 21 and the disciples' dullness. Because now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? And having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand see the disciples had forgotten something they'd forgotten provisions basically okay uh, they had brought along only one loaf of bread and if you uh, remember there are 12 disciples or apostles and Jesus that's 13 grown men okay one loaf of bread is clearly positively, absolutely not enough for 13 grown men. It's just not. There is no way it could be enough. It's not nearly enough. But they still don't get it. They don't get it. I mean, five loaves and two fish, that was not nearly enough to feed 5,000 men plus women and children. Seven loaves and a few small fish, that wasn't nearly enough to feed 4,000 men plus women and children. And yet it had. But if we're, if we're thinking about this and how they don't get it, I mean, you, you look at Jesus' metaphorical statement and how it is totally misunderstood by them. He warns them against the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. Matthew 16, by the way, adds the Sadducees in there. And when he says this, they think he's getting onto their case because they didn't bring enough bread. Their misunderstanding is perplexing to us. I mean, twice. Twice he's taken very, very, very little food and fed very, very, very many people. Surely, if he's concerned about them just having one loaf for 13 people, surely that one loaf is going to stretch. I mean, it's Jesus after all. If their misunderstanding is perplexing to us, it's probably even more perplexing to Jesus. See, the disciples had forgotten, so Jesus reminds them. He reminds them with some questions. And the first questions are some general, general questions, uh, almost rhetorical questions. He starts by saying, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? You know, if, if Charles Schultz was writing this in a Peanuts comic strip, he would have Charlie Brown saying, good grief. Am I right? I mean, good grief. People, what are you talking about? Why are you making such a big deal about this? Why are you discussing the fact you have no bread? And then he asked him two questions. Do you not yet perceive or understand? 
And then having eyes do you not see and having ears do you not hear? These two questions, while not sequential in the text, tie what he's saying here back to uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 12, where you see Jesus cites Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 as to why he spoke to the crowds in parables. Because the crowds were outsiders, and he speaks to them so that having ears they would not hear, and having eyes they would not perceive. And, and, and so, so, so that they wouldn't understand, and, and to, to, uh, to hide the meaning from the outsiders, from the crowds. And here Jesus is saying that to the disciples. He's saying, y'all are just like those people who haven't spent the past several couple of years with me. You're just like the people who haven't seen everything that I've done over the past couple of years. You're just like those on the outside. And then in between those two questions, he asks, are your hearts hardened? Well, remember Mark 6, verse 52? After Jesus feeds the 5,000, after the story of him walking on the water to them, Mark flat out tells us, they didn't understand about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. They're still not getting it. And so after these rhetorical questions, Jesus then asks them a couple of specific questions. He says, do you not remember? And he says, I want you to remember two situations here. First of all, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls did you pick up afterwards? And they said 12. That's exactly the right answer. Okay, they remember. And he says, and now when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said seven. And he says, very good, you're two for two. You remember. And then the summary question. Do you not yet understand? Don't you get it? Don't you understand what's happening here and what I'm trying to teach you? Understand what? Well, you know, from Mark's gospel, we sort of can speculate as to what he was wanting them to understand. Fortunately, Matthew doesn't leave room for speculation. He flat out tells us what Jesus wanted them to understand. Matthew 16, verse 11, it's consistent with Mark's contextual clues. It says, How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them about to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The immediate context of the misunderstood statement of Jesus seems to indicate that Mark is implying the same meaning that Matthew gives directly. See, Ultimately, though, the disciples' failure to understand about the loaves, which leads to their misunderstanding the warning about the yeast or the leaven of the Pharisees, was based on a misunderstanding about Jesus' identity as the Christ. Putting it simply, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. So before Jesus fed the 4,000 and the 5,000 for that matter, he asked the disciples pretty much the same question. How many loaves do you have? Do, do you notice that it really didn't matter how many loaves they had? Because you see, they didn't have enough. It didn't matter how many they had because it was not going to feed the number of people that they needed to feed. But the, but the point is that when we give what we have to God, He's going to make up the difference. You see, it wasn't the disciples' contribution that fed the crowds of people. It was Jesus that fed the crowds of people. They gave all that they had 
And Jesus did something great with it. Then, when the Pharisees asked for a sign, demand a sign, despite everything that he had done up to that point, Jesus sighs. He sighs because he had done so many things. And they didn't get it. They didn't believe who he was, who he claimed to be. They were, were a source of frustration towards him. And so he sighs. They'd ask questions. But they really didn't want the answer to him. See, they asked questions, but, but, but what they wanted was an answer that they could turn or twist and use against Jesus. And that's why Jesus, when he gets into the boat and they start to cross back over to the other side, he warns them about the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and Herod or the Herodians. That's why he warns them about their teaching. So now I ask you, do you not yet understand? After everything that Jesus has done for you, what has he done for you? Well, let's see. He left heaven and came to earth. He was born into poverty. He lived some 33 years here on this earth. Then he suffered and died the cruelest, most inhumane death that man has ever been able to devise. And three days later, he rose from the dead. What has Jesus done for you? Everything you needed. After all he's done for you, are you still waiting for him to do more before you commit to him? Let me ask you this. What more could he do for you? After everything Jesus has done for you, do you still not trust that he is going to take care of your every need? Do you still not trust him enough to say, yes, I, I believe that even though I may not have everything that I want, he's going to provide that which I need. Do you not trust him enough that when he says go into all the world and make the disciples of all nations that some of those to be made disciples of are in fact your friends. Do you not trust him enough that if those friends turn away from you because you're trying to follow him that he's going to provide better friends for you? Or more friends for you? Do you not trust that when he says, I want you to uh, do X, Y, Z, that that's exactly what he wants? He doesn't want us to add um, A, B, and C to that? Jesus has done so much for us. And what he asks in return is that we live our lives for him. You know, we're at that time of the year where we start to think about next year, start to think about resolutions, areas where we can do better in the coming year than we did in the past year. Why don't we resolve that we are going to trust Him more? Maybe you need to express that trust this morning by being immersed in the watery grave of baptism, having your sins washed away. If so, then don't let this year end before you make that commitment. Or maybe you've made the commitment, but you haven't been faithful to that commitment. Maybe what you need to do is maybe privately just pray where you're at, asking God to help you do better in 2019 than you did in 2018 at being what he calls you to be. Or perhaps you need to make that declaration publicly, asking the church here to pray with you and to pray for you. Whatever that response is, don't leave here without making that response. Don't you get it? He calls you to an abundant, full life. To have that abundant, full life, all you've got to do is respond. 
we can help you through a public response to accept that, then won't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together?